All right, so we're going to start. All right, so my name is Ilya. I'm one of the uh, PGY3 residents here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about prescribing CrossFit as exercise, um, some of the literature on the risks and benefits of CrossFit, as well as uh, compare it to some of the recommendations from the American College of Sports Medicine on prescribing exercise. So full disclosure, I do do CrossFit, um, which is why I thought that um, this would be a good talk for me to give. Uh, I've been doing CrossFit for about six and a half years. Um, I'm going to try to be non-biased, um, but clearly I really like it. So I hope you enjoy. Um, so as an outline, so I'm going to try to define exercise and fitness, um, both from kind of what the American College of Sports Medicine has said, as well as CrossFit's self-made definition. Um, then I'm going to go over some of the, the terms, the history, and the program structure of CrossFit, uh, as well as the definition of exercise and fitness from a CrossFit perspective. Um, and then going to some of the literature of the risk and benefits of prescribing CrossFit, um, you know, selecting the right patient population, you know, whether it's appropriate for a layperson, and uh, you know, how do you kind of select the right program. So what is fitness? So up here, there's examples of people that are very specialized in uh, certain aspects of fitness. Um, Bekdad Salimi, this guy on the right, is the uh, Olympic world record holder in the uh, uh, snatch in the heavyweight category. Um, he can lift, you know, 500 plus pounds over his head. Um, you know, the guy in the bottom is uh, Bernard Lagat. He's the uh, indoor um, record holder for the American uh, 1500 meter and 5000 distances. And uh, this person on the right is uh, extremely, obviously, very flexible. Um, so these are obviously, you know, different aspects of fitness um, taken to an extreme point of view, but they're all equally as important um, as you know anyone who's a resident here knows. You know, your ability to perform your, your ADLs. Um, in your transfers, you know, you have to have some aspect of strength. A lot of the patients we have in our, you know, hospitals and in, as an inpatient don't have any endurance. Um, they're very limited by their fatigue, even, you know, getting up, moving around just, just a little bit. And, uh, you know, people's mobility is also, you know, their passive and active range of motion often limits them. Um, so these are all important aspects of fitness. So to go into the kind of the history of the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, Dr. Mayton gives us a really good talk at the beginning of our PGY2 year. Um, and uh, but to go into a little bit more detail, you know, the American College of Sports Medicine is started in the 1950s, and they're kind of charged with uh, giving guidelines for uh, prescribing fitness. Um, and the the key guidelines, you know, they fall into this fit concept: uh, frequency, intensity, timing, and type. Um, and so the you know the the specifics have changed. Um, you know, as you can see, in 1975, it used to be you had to exercise. They recommended exercising three times a week at 60 to 90 percent of your VO2 max for 20 to 30 minutes at a time, um, and that's changed. You know, it's gone back and forth. Um, and I'll talk about the newest recommendations in a second. Um, but yeah, so the the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines they've evolved. Um, they keep putting out a new position paper every couple few years, and the last one uh, was in 2013. And it turned it used to be like a ten-page paper that you know kind of focused on those four concepts of, of fit, and now it's turned into a full textbook. It's um, 438 pages that is very comprehensive, and it goes into specific recommendations for different um, disease pathologies, um, contraindications, um, and like I said, how to manage specific illnesses. Um, so, so the more recent recommendations, they've also made it so that the um, they've changed it to F I T T E. Um, so. They really focus on uh, the type, on making the exercise functional and integrative movements, movements that use multiple joints as opposed to, you know, just bicep curls or single single joint isolating exercises. And also the um, the E stands for enjoyment or uh, support supervision. The psychosocial aspect of exercise they find is really important in uh, helping people um, stay on a program and not get burnt out or not get you know just drop out from uh, any exercise program that they start. Um, and also the you know the guidelines they used to just say you have to you know they recommended exercising two or three times per week at a certain intensity. Now the recommendations are five times per week, or greater than 150 minutes per week, or 500 metabolic equivalents um, minutes per week. So they're kind of throwing in a component of exercise intensity over here on the right. You can see that there's a chart for the metabolic equivalents for different types of exercise. Um, you know, golfing is three mets, um, whereas sprinting is going to be 10 mets. So you, know, you have to do a lot less sprinting to get your uh, 500 metabolic equivalents as opposed to you know playing golf. Um, and so they also, you know, the newest recommendations, they say two to three times per week of doing cardiopulmonary exercise, two to three times per week of doing resistance exercise, and one to two times a week of doing mobility or range of motion um, exercise. 
And interestingly enough, they say in the 2011 um, edition, they started saying combine these different modalities if possible. Um, again, the functional component, use multiple joint movements, and preferably in a group setting with supervision from an instructor or a coach. Um, they find that those, you know, if you do it in a group setting with a coach, you're, particularly with a coach, you're less likely to get hurt and you're more likely to stick with the program. So the CrossFit definition of exercise and fitness. Um, so I put these in here because there's a lot of misconceptions about what CrossFit is. Um, anything from, um, you know, people saying that CrossFit isn't a real sport, it's just really, you know, you get really good at exercising. Um, to, you know, this guy in the bottom left who has horrendous form um, and people, you know, just assume that people in CrossFit just move really quickly and have no, you know, concern for form um, or that, you know, that it's a cult, um, you know, like I just mentioned, you know, sometimes, you know, according to the American College of Sports Medicine, it can be beneficial to work out in a group. Um, it is engaging. You know, some people, you know, think that that, that makes CrossFit a cult. Um, so to go into some of the history, um, this is important because, you know, the demographics of people doing CrossFit is changing, so um, it's important to know about. So CrossFit was initially designed by a guy named Greg Glassman. Um, he was a gymnast um, in high school and college, and in the 70s and 80s, he was trying to find exercises or a workout that would challenge him uh, metabolically, that would he would have to keep precision in his movements. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing a, a tumbling floor routine as a gymnast, you, you know, you need to be doing these really precise flips and jumps um, and you're sprinting across a, a gymnastics floor. So it's really important for you to be able to keep real, um, high precision in your movements when you're really fatigued. So he came up with these exercises for that stated purpose, to try to really tax people and try to have them, you know, maintain precision in, you know, functional mul multiple joint movements. Um, so then, you know, he obviously, he got hurt. He uh, quit his uh, career as a, you know, amateur gymnast. Um, he started as a personal trainer in the early 90s, and he found that, you know, he, he gave some people these exercises that he had just kind of come up with and that they, they really enjoyed them and they, you know, they lost a lot of weight, they got a lot of benefit out of them and they started asking him to do more of them. Um, so eventually he started putting people that were doing this, um, he was doing, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions, he found that when he had people doing in small groups of two or three, if he chose the patient, you know, the people um, correctly, that they would challenge each other and push each other and they would get more out of it. So eventually it turned into, in 1995, he opened up the first CrossFit gym um, in Santa Cruz, California called CrossFit Santa Cruz. Um, that you know, kind of focused on doing this. He got a lot of his personal training clients together and opened up this uh, facility where he would kind of have small group classes. Um, and at the same time, you know, some of his uh, personal training clients uh, were members of the Santa Cruz Police Department, and you know, they talked about his methods to uh, their police chief. And uh, he got a contract to train the Santa Cruz Police Department. <laughs> and that you know, these police officers were were kind of saying similar things as to what the in initial um, intention was. That you know, as a police officer, you have to you know chase people down, you're under metabolic duress, and then you have to perform a very um, precise task, such as shooting. And so they found that their, their shooting and their performance at their jobs was getting better as they you know, were doing these exercises because it prepared them for that task. So then, you know, some of the other clients at, the, at this CrossFit gym were um, computer programmers. And computer programmers are very into um, kind of you know, open source models of uh, sharing things. So they encouraged Greg Glassman to uh, launch a website called you know, CrossFit.com, and they just posted their workouts on this website to see if you know people would enjoy them or just to kind of you know, spread the word. Um, and eventually, this turned into a lot of other people starting their own CrossFit affiliates. Um, there were 15 gyms in 2005. Um, they started an international competition in 2007 called the CrossFit Games, which is held in California every year. Um, and now it's um, televised on ESPN. And you know, once that happened, the the number of gyms kind of uh, skyrocketed, and you had 1,700 gyms across the world in 2010, and over 10,000 gyms over, all over the world in 2014. Um, so I, I say this not to brag about the number of gyms that, that there are in CrossFit, but just to say that you know now that this this is on ESPN and there's 10,000 plus gyms, um, the people that are doing this are obviously a little different than the people that first started as you know personal training clients that Greg Glassman deemed appropriate for this. You know, initially um, Greg Glassman was working particularly with MMA fighters, um, police officers, people that were you know, already pretty adept at moving, um, that wanted to challenge themselves. Um, whereas now, you know, you have people that are, you know, couch potatoes or that see someone on TV and say, well, I want to look like that. And then they show up at a CrossFit gym, their, their movement capacity, um, you know, their, their previous mobility, their previous cardiopulmonary function, um, may be substantially different than the people that first started CrossFit. And that, you know, kind of affects the, uh, injury potential for these athletes. 
Um, so it's kind of just going to, I, don't, I doubt you guys can see this very well, but this is a, a list of all the different exercises that were performed um, that were recommended on the CrossFit main website um, from 2008 to 2013. So at the top of the list, um, you know, running, pull-ups, deadlifts, box jumps, air squats, push-ups, handstand push-ups, um, throwing a wall ball to a 10-foot target, uh, kettlebell swings, thrusters, which are, you know, I'll show you guys more thoroughly in a sec, is a front squat to an overhead press. Um, so these are just some of the some of the movements and how frequently they're uh, recommended or prescribed on this uh, on the CrossFit main site. You know, running is typically seen, you know, 55 to 65 times per year, so about once a week. Some of these other movements, you know, typically run 30 to 40 times per um, per year. So, you know, you'll see see these exercises thrown in kind of randomly. Um, but if you guys are interested, the, the paper sent out has this figure in it as well, just so you kind of get, you guys kind of get a feel for the different exercises that are that are put up there. Um, and again, you know, some of the uh, initially when these workouts were done, uh, they weren't done in a CrossFit gym. They were kind of done garage style or people would kind of do this in a small group or by themselves. They'd look at whatever workout was posted on the website um, and they would, you know, just try to do this workout, see if they could finish it or how it felt. Um, whereas now um, in CrossFit gyms, um, the workouts are, are a little bit different. They're more supervised. There's always at least one or two coaches present for every session. Um, they include typically a mobility or warm up session. They have you go for a warm up run. They have you do some mobility work specific to what your movements you're doing in that class. You know, they'll have you work on your squat mobility, your hip flexibility, your ankle flexibility before you're going to do a squat session. Um, if the squat is in the conditioning workout or in the strength session for that day. Um, and then they follow it up with a strength or skill session. Again, they try to make it specific as somewhat to uh, whatever the workout is for that day. And then there's a conditioning piece or a wad, a workout of the day where it's the, you know, the, the metabolic um, component of that class. So the structure of the wads or the workouts of the day. So there's there's different types of workouts. Um, initially, they're either AMRAPs or rounds for or RFTs, rounds for time. What that simply means is, you know, they say, you know, as many rounds as possible, and let's say 10 minutes or 20 minutes of certain exercise, say five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, 15 squats, go. And they see how far you can get. Or rounds for time, they say, you know, five rounds of whatever these exercises are for this many reps, go. Um, but you know, when you when you put a work capacity demand like that, there's no preface of um, the movement quality. So some of the more advanced workouts, um, you know, every minute on the minute or EMOM or, or unbroken sets, they, they have people slow down more and they really have them focus on the movement quality. Um, so for example, you can have an every minute on the minute of a clean and jerk, like two reps, but you're not continuously going back and forth. You're, you have to stop every minute, you know, maybe put on more weight or maybe continue with the same weight and continue to go that way. So it kind of puts more of a, a preface on uh, movement quality um, as opposed to just kind of getting work done and um, fatiguing uh, the individual. So, for example, Fran was the first was the first CrossFit workout devised by Greg Glassman. Um, the workouts are given girls' names. Um, I won't go into that, but the, um, the so in this in this workout, it's 21 barbell thrusters, like I mentioned, front squat to an overhead press, followed by 21 pull-ups. Put pull-ups in parentheses um, because again, these movements these movements are chosen to you know promote. Uh, power output or work capacity. So in, in the CrossFit sense, kipping pull-ups or swinging pull-ups get that task done better than strict pull-ups. Strict pull-ups are done you know, typically in strength sessions in CrossFit, but kipping pull-ups um, kind of get the job done faster. So um, there's definitely a chance, you know, increased risk for injury based on that, but um, you know, that can be debated. You guys are welcome to ask questions about that towards the end. Um, so yeah, so in Fran, you have 21 thrusters followed by 21 pull-ups, then 15 of each of those movements, then nine of each of those movements. So I have a video, we'll see if it works. So this is at the CrossFit Games, the uh, international competition. This is Rich Froning, he won four um, of these competitions um, in CrossFit circles, he's a big deal. But I want you guys to kind of pay attention to, hopefully this won't be too loud, and hopefully it runs. So when, they, so when he does this movement, you can see that his, his midline is stable throughout the exercise. He's taking his time. He's not, you know, the farther along he gets in this, he's not compromising his form. I think this commentator is obnoxious, so I'm going to turn this volume down. So you can see every rep looks the same. I mean, he's getting, uh, you know, metabolically taxed, but at the same time, he's not sacrificing his form. I mean, this is why he's the best at this in the world. Now he's got a headband on, so he doesn't sweat. <laughs> It's hard enough. You don't need a blindfold. 
and then I'm gonna keep this going for just a little bit. So you can see when he does these pull-ups, again, they all look very under control. He's, I mean, he's swinging, but you know, the movement is pretty controlled. He's not hyperextending his shoulders. Um, he's just kind of using that kip to help him get up and get this work done, um, distributing the work throughout his lower body as well as his upper body to kind of get it done. And you can see, I mean, he keeps doing this, you know, that, that barbell is loaded with 100 pounds and he's continuing to do this. He ends up doing 45 reps of, of those thrusters and every single one looks exactly the same. So for him, I would say this workout doesn't present much of an injury risk. Um, but if you've seen other, you know, other people do this workout at a CrossFit gym, they don't all look like that. So um, when you have closed chain um, kinetic exercises, you know, with a heavy load on the other end, um, you, you can end up losing form and hyperextending your back. So, you know, there is some risk in this. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, so the long-term structure of this, of CrossFit program, that kind of went into the you know, specific uh, structure within one workout. Um, the long-term structure, so typically it's, they were recommended to do three days on of training, one day off. That was just something that, that Greg Glassman came up with. Um, again, the beginning of the of, of CrossFit, there was more of an open source random program. People would kind of pick and choose workouts on one website or another website. Um, whereas now, um, different gyms plan long-term cycles to help promote um, improvements in strength over time. And they try to limit, um, hopefully try to limit some of the volume that are, that's done within one workout. There's kind of best practices that are emerging. There's different, different websites that are kind of specific for different patient populations, different athlete populations, those that want to be uh, competitors, those that want to focus on their Olympic lifting, on their gymnastics. Um, so people can kind of follow along long-term specific programming for whatever their goals are. Um, but there still is no unified approach um, for, you know, getting people to, to start CrossFit and on-ramp or initiation pr uh, protocol, progression through um, CrossFit or to return from an injury. There's no standard protocol. Um, so CrossFit defined fitness in one of three ways. Um, this definition's kind of evolved over time. So initially, Greg Glassman talked about the ability to perform uh, large loads, long distances quickly um, so that you can test your work capacity. Um, he also talked about constantly varied functional movements performed at high intensity in communal environments, which sounds very similar to what the American College of Sports Medicine is talking about, and also preparedness for the unknown, which, you know, from, from our perspective as rehab doctors, um, sounds very nice. I mean, it's, it's, you know, hopefully appropriate for, you know, getting people um, able to do their ADLs and transfers, and um, hopefully, you know, if, if that were to be the case, that would be great. So testing work capacity, um, the pros of that is that it's it's measurable and you can put down, a, you know, start a stopwatch, um, see how many rep repetitions someone's doing, you know, the weight, you know, the distance that they're traveling. Um, so it's really easy to do research on something like that or for personal tracking. People are, uh, you know, very focused on the, on the time they get at the end of a workout. Unfortunately, the cons of that of testing for capacity is that the, the definition is mechanical, not biomechanical. And by that, I mean that you know, when you're testing work capacity, you're not testing movement quality. Um, people can, you know, highly like hyperextend their back or, um, and that's not counted in the, uh, or, you know, they can squat not to full depth. That's not, you know, counted in your test for work capacity, nor does it improve the individual doing the, uh, doing the exercise. Um, and also, you know, when, when you're always going for a time, when your exercise is always a test, um, you're not necessarily training or progressing. You can go past fatigue. Uh, and you can limit your progress because you're always, you know, if you're, if, if every day is game day, you know, you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself a lot more than, uh, than get better at what you're doing. So the second part of that definition, um, like I mentioned before, it's very appropriate for the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines. Um, functional movements is right out of the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines. Um, you know, these movements are picked for their ability to produce power when you have multiple joint movements. Um, you know, you may, just doing those, you know, thrusters for 20 reps may not, may have looked like weightlifting, but at that, at the end of that set of 20, you're going to be really fatigued, um, from a cardiovascular standpoint. Um, so high intensity, this can fit with the ACSM guidelines on intensity. Um, uh, it depends on the comorbid conditions. I mean, they, they do talk about just, you know, the, the recommendations are just those 500 met equivalents minutes per week. Um, but you know, if someone is limited by fatigue, you know, if they can barely get up and walk around, that may not be, uh, the, you know, high intensity by a CrossFit standard may not be the best prescription for them. Um, so in a communal environment is straight out of the ACSM guidelines. It fits in really well, having that supervision, having a group around you to kind of help motivate, keep you keep you there for long periods of time. Um, the constantly varied part is the, the is where CrossFit kind of gets into some trouble. Um, you know, it's good in a, in a cross training sense to, to change your exercises around, keep people entertained, engaged. Um, however, you know, it depends on the, you know, what workouts picked. Um, whether that's safe or efficacious, you know, one of the CrossFit workouts is just to do 100 pull-ups for time. 
you know, that may not be the best idea for anybody. Um, but, you know, so maybe that workout, if you saw that on the website, you may, you may not want to do that workout. Um, so, again, preparing for the unknown um, is one of the CrossFit tenets of fitness. Um, so, you know, as we're talking about functional movements or transferable movement patterns, um, you know, those, that, that's great. Um, however, there are limitations to that. Uh, so all the movements in CrossFit are performed in the frontal plane. There's very rarely unilateral exercises performed. Um, and not all the movements that are done are transferable to CrossFit or away from CrossFit, for example. Um, high volume box jumps is, are something that's done somewhat regularly, which is, you know, just jumping from the ground to typically a 20 or 24 inch box and back down for high repetitions. Um, and this has been known, there's, there's only one case report that I'll talk about, but this has been known within the CrossFit circles to cause uh, Achilles tear injuries. I mean, so the original reason box jumps were made was to test in a, you know, one rep max uh, setting, you know, someone's maximum power output, you know, jumping vertically. But when you, when your goal is to try to, you know, cardiopulmonarily fatigue somebody, um, you know, you can, if you're using the wrong exercise, you can end up hurting, you know, having people do a lot of injuries. Thanks, Sam. So in the, uh, in the literature, there's, uh, I'm going to talk about 10 case reports and four uh, studies that were performed on CrossFit. Um, so there's not too much literature yet, really, in the last year or two. They've uh, started to publish a lot more on this. Um, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why that hasn't happened. I mean, for, for one, you have to work with a you know private company. Um, you know, they're all individually owned gyms, um, which makes it kind of difficult to to do some of these studies. Also, there was some litigation involved, which I'll talk about um, by CrossFit to one of, on you know to the researchers that performed a study just this last year that could limit um, researchers' willingness to kind of explore uh, CrossFit as a as a sub you know subject matter. So some of the case reports. They'll talk about the uh, random myosis is uh, really prevalent. Um, there's, you know, five reports in the literature from 2009, 2015. Um, there's a lot of talk in the CrossFit community about limiting this, but it's really hard to um, really control all the variables. I mean, if someone's really tired, you know, if, if, if the point of the workout program is to push people towards their, their levels of fatigue, um, their limits of fatigue, it's going to be really hard to, to really see push if you're going to push somebody too far, if they're going to get rhabdo. Um, so Schulte and all did a, did a really good um, case report. They, they pretty much went to a competition and just wanted to see what injuries happened at a competition. And they found that there was like 100 people that, they, that were at this competition and about 30, 35% of them um, came out with injuries. They were all tears to their skin, um, to typically their hands. I mean, if you're doing high volumes of pull-ups, um, a lot of people rip their hands. Um, again, in a competition setting, this is more prevalent than, uh, than, than happens in, in an actual gym. I mean, CrossFitters and coaches are pretty... Um, aware of this injury, and so they tend to tell people, hey, if you feel like your hands are starting to rip or if you feel a lot of stress on your hands, stop. Um, but still, there's not as much awareness as to the the, the risks and the complications of uh, um, wounds on people's hands as, pos as is possible. Um, interestingly enough, there were several cases on carotid artery dissection, uh, which I thought found was very alarming. I'd never heard of this before looking, looking into the research for this talk. Um, and, you know, both of these Researchers talked about the potential mechanism as being, you know, if you're if you're throwing a barbell from your shoulders to overhead for high repetitions and you're um, valsalving a lot, you know, you could have a certain amount of um, JVD, and then you're, you know, causing direct trauma by dropping a barbell pretty quickly onto your, you know, onto your neck. So, you know, something to be wary of if you're, you know, people are in a lot of, you know, very fatigued, um, you know, they may want to limit their uh, their shoulder to overhead movements, um, especially ballistically. Um, there's one article written about uh, retinal detachment. Um, obviously, you know, some of these gyms are, you know, set, most of these gyms are in, in warehouses that the quality of the equipment isn't great a lot of times. So, um, the focus isn't always on, um, maintaining the equipment. So, you know, it's something to be wary of, um, make, you know, if you're going to recommend this to, to, a, you know, patient, make sure that they're aware that, you know, they want to go to a place or they want to use equipment that's working properly. That's not, you know, bands that aren't frayed. Um, and again, there's, there's only been one. Uh, mentioned the literature of Achilles tendon rupture. However, you know, if you're in the CrossFit circles, it's talked about pretty a decent amount that uh, Achilles tendon ruptures do happen pretty regularly, um, especially in competitors that are doing really high volume of box jumps. So this is a, a case, this is a somewhat of a traumatic video um, of a guy 
who was in a competition in January 2014 um, who suffered a traumatic spinal cord injury doing this lift. This is the video of his injury. Um, I mean, you don't, there's no blood and gore, but you see him fall over as he, uh, as he tries to complete this lift. So I'll kind of play this. Oh, it didn't actually play over here. So a couple times. So you'll see um, the mechanism of him hurting himself is, is questionable. Um, so there, you know, it look, if, you, if you watch the video, it looks like on the way up um, doing the lift, he, his back gives out and he falls. Um, so there, the two suspected mechanisms of this, I mean, this wasn't written up. This is just the most common, uh, sorry, the most famous, infamous um, injury within the CrossFit community. Um, so the thought is that he either had some grade of like anterolisthesis of his lumbar spine. And then, you know, he was, this was in a competition. This was the ninth workout in two days that he had performed. So the thought that, you know, if his paraspinal muscles were spasming um, and he had some premorbid anterolisthesis that his, you know, he could have severed his spine that way um, just by putting too much load on them. Um, the other thing that happened is I, if you guys can see, uh, it close the video, is that those weights behind him are really close to him. So that bar actually, when he did drop it, bounced off of those weights and hit him in, in his back. So there's some component of trauma that happened during that. Um, they may have been responsible for his injuries. So there's several um, retrospective, prospective studies that have been done. Hack it all was uh, a good uh, study that was performed in 2013. Um, they pretty much gave out a questionnaire uh, via several CrossFit forums, um, and they asked people for you know their demographics, what kind of program they followed, how how you know how often, how much they they worked, they did CrossFit, and what injuries they had. Um, so they had 132 people respond. 97 of those reported injuries, which was 73 percent. Uh, again, this is over like people like have you ever gotten an injury doing CrossFit? Um, so 186 total injuries were reported. Um, nine required surgery, which was seven percent. Um, they found that the injury rate was 3.1 per 1,000 training hours, and mostly there were shoulder and spine injuries that were uh, predominant. And this is a a, a chart. Oh, I doubt you guys can see this, but. Um, of uh, the injury rates in different sports, the the top chart is is for uh, top graph is for um, during competition, and the bottom graph is for just during training. Um, so I'll kind of tell you about this because you can't see it. So down at the on, in the training um, graph, so the top says uh, men's baseball players get injured at a rate of 1.9 uh, per 1,000 uh, training hours. Um, men men's ice hockey 2.0 um, per 1,000 training hours. And down at the bottom here, you have women's gymnastics. Um, in training, they get hurt 6.1 um, per 1,000 training hours. And at the bottom is um, men's spring football. And the injury rate there is 9.6 per 1,000 training hours. So, I mean, CrossFit does fall in there um, towards the lower end of that. Um, you know, if, you, if you're going to start talking. So those injury rates for that study, they didn't specify whether that whether those injuries were in a competition or during training. Um, so up here at the top, during, the, um, during competition, um, the injury rates go from women's softball at 4.3 per 1,000 training hours to men's football at 30, 35.9 per 1,000 training hours. So again, CrossFit falls on the lower end of that. Um, you know, the quality of that study, I mean, you know, whether they included everybody, um, you know, whether people re re responded that just had injuries, whether there's a predominance of that isn't really known. Um, but just so you guys have some sort of, you know, spectrum of where CrossFit injuries fall. Uh, compared to other sports. Um, so Weisenthal and his group did a, another uh, observational study in 2014. Um, again, they, they handed out a survey. They made it available at CrossFit gyms, um, but they didn't necessarily get make it. Everybody at that CrossFit gym had to respond um, in Rochester, New York City, and Philadelphia, as well as online in several forums. They got 486 people to respond. Um, of those, 386 were included. And they, they tested, they asked if anyone had any new musculoskeletal pain um, leading to them having to discontinue doing CrossFit for greater than one week, modification of their routine for greater than two weeks, or uh, any healthcare visit. Uh, they found an injury prevalence of 19.4%, which they compared to a running um, injury prevalence of uh, 40% um, from several papers that they cited. And they found that the injury rate was 2.4 per 1,000 training hours. Um, again, they cited mostly shoulder, back, and knee injuries. Um, those are the you know 21 shoulder injuries, 12 back injuries, and 11 knee injuries out of 84 total reported injuries. Um, they didn't find any difference in the age of any of the participants, um, whether that had a you know predisposing factor or uh, whether the experience of the CrossFitter had any um, pre predisposed them to an injury. Whether you know people that had just started were more likely to get hurt. Um, they did find, however, a significant difference 
um, between people that were training at, in a gym setting versus on their own um, with, the, with a p-value of 0 0.028. Apparently someone's calling in. Um, so there's another study. Um, there's a prospective cohort study by Greer et al. in 2013. Um, so this is an interesting study because they, they actually use military recruits. So people in the military have been uh, experimenting with using CrossFit as a training modality for, for a while. Um, so in this study, um, they took uh, people, you know, military recruits, and they put them in one of several groups, either a group that was uh, kind of just doing a regular you know, military training protocol, which you know, involves a lot of um, you know, running with a rucksack, um, push-ups, pull-ups, um, or advanced tactical athlete conditioning, which um, is more functional movements, but without really a weight component. I mean, it's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of what you see people in like basketball doing um, as a warm up. a lot of, you know, um, great vines, a lot of kind of like deep lunges, um, more kind of, you know, warm up exercises, kind of full body stretching exercises or uh, CrossFit, or as they called it, extreme conditioning program. Um, so they got 1,032 participants in the uh, extreme conditioning or um, program and they got 340 uh, subjects in the traditional program. Um, this is actually nice because they actually double blinded this study. They just tracked people's ICD-9 codes at the doctor's visits that they had. You know, military recruits have to um, have a physical before their um, boot camp as well as after. So they just tracked the ICD-9 codes. Um, they found that pre-morbidly uh, people had, uh, you know, 41% of people in the uh, CrossFit group had injuries before they started and 46% of people after they finished. Um, and in the control group, 50% of people had an injury before they started and 57% of people had an injury after they finished and they didn't find that statistically significant. So roughly five to seven people percent of people got an injury from, from their boot camp. Um, and they, they, they said that, you know, those five to seven percent of people typically are people that just got injured from starting a new program or, you know, ramping up their level of fitness. Um, the, they did find, they you know, did a lot of covariate analysis and found the predisposing factors for people getting hurt was a high BMI, uh, smoking, running greater than 16 miles per week. Um, on the PFT, if you couldn't do 60 sit-ups um, in two minutes, or if your mile time was greater than 13.5 minutes, that you're more likely to get hurt. Um, so, <clears throat> so again, I mean, this kind of goes, talks to, you know, people that were starting CrossFit in the early days, in the late 90s, um, early 2000s, they're maybe less likely to get hurt, but people that are, you know, have been a couch potato or really out of shape, if you can't do some of these basic, um, basic, you know, cardi cardiopulmonary or strength tasks, if you have no midline stability, if you can, can't run a, a mile in, in under 13 minutes, maybe CrossFit isn't the best program for these individuals. They also commented on the fact that, I mean, they didn't uh, um, get any, you know, statistical data, but um, they found that people that did do the CrossFit program, they, they you know, uh, anecdotally found that they had um, more, they're more likely to, to benefit, um, to complete their missions, and they, they cited that, you know, these, these, these people were um, stronger than their uh, counterparts that didn't go through a CrossFit training program. So again, the, the carryover, the functional carryover of incorporating a strength component to your training um, was beneficial for, for you know, military recruits. So some of the studies that talk about the benefit of CrossFit, um, Bill et al. in 2012 did a study of uh, 21 moderately fit undergraduate males. Um, they pretty much recruited people and said, we're going to pay for you to do CrossFit for a month. And, you know, they got 21 people that were crazy enough to try it. Um, so they put them through for four weeks, um, three to four times per week um, in a supervised setting, again, for, for one hour sessions. And they found that they had statistically significant increase in their mile run, their pro agility test, which if you guys don't know what that is, it's, you know, they set up a few cones and they have you sprint from um, one cone forward and then around a cone on the side and back um, in an L shape. They also found statistically significant increases in people's squats and bench press, and they didn't record any injuries during that four-week period. Um, Smith et al. Did a, did a study in 2013. They followed four to three members at uh, a CrossFit gym in Ohio. They found this, you know, a gym that would be agreeable to let them, you know, track their members um, for 10 weeks. Um, they followed 23 men and 20 women. Um, they measured their maximum aerobic capacity pre and post workout with the Bruce protocol, uh, which if you guys don't know what that is, they, they have you run on a treadmill um, and every minute they increase um, the speed on that treadmill um, until you get to your uh, VO2 max. Um, and they also, you know, check people's body composition. Um, they found that 11 people dropped out. Um, this is where the, the litigation happened. 
Um, the researchers just cited injuries. They said they followed up with these people. Um, interestingly enough, one of the people that did drop out was a lawyer. <laughs> And he was very quick to file, you know, he's also an avid CrossFitter and was very quick to file suit and say, hey, no one followed up with me. And it turns out that of those 11 people, 10 of them weren't actually hurt. Just no one followed up with them. They just assumed they were injured. Um, so since then, the journal that published this study has, uh, you know, put it, put in an erratum that said, by the way, we made a mistake. No, you know, the researchers admitted they made a mistake. These people weren't followed. And, you know, very few, only one of these 11 people was actually hurt. Um, so to look at their data, um, they found that there were significant changes in the uh, patient's weight, uh, BMI, uh, decrease in body fat, increase in lean body mass, and a substantially um, significant increase in their VO2 max. So, you know, they, they lost weight, they got, you know, they got leaner and they, uh, their cardiopulmonary performance went up. So, in summary, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefits. Um, from, from what I've shown, there still aren't that many studies that have been done, um, and the studies are, are pretty limited. A lot of them are, you know, just surveys, but, you know, in general, it, CrossFit does fit pretty well with the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines um, for the, the fit uh, concept, um, particularly the newer guidelines, 2011, 2013, that incorporate, um, you know, the enjoyment factor, the, the psychosocial aspect of, you know, getting people in a group under, under supervision setting. Um, you know, it works as a, as a cross-training tool for um, people that are at kind of an intermediate level. Um, you know, it improves your cardio, people's cardiopulmonary function, their strength, their body composition. Um, it's also very time efficient because you're, you are combining these different um, factors that you're trying to improve. Um, the risks um, are similar or better uh, from the studies that were done compared to other sports. Um, you know, the, the one Problem. The, the biggest problem is that you know the constantly varied component of CrossFit does predispose people um, to injury risk. Again, that's anecdotal. I mean, there's nothing in the literature that says that, um, and it is getting better. You know, there are, like I said, long-term programs that are focusing on progressive overload in a lot of CrossFit gyms these days. Um, but again, there's there's not specific research um, that that's really going to talk about. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to get really good at research on CrossFit because every gym is performing its its own program. Uh, there's no, you know, standardization of a lot of um, protocols in CrossFit, so it, it, there's not much research, and the research there is isn't very specific. Um, so the future directions, I mean, again, the the on ramp there is um, int like introduction or on ramp programming at every gym. It can vary. You know, some gyms they can put you through a one hour session and say, all right, you know the movements, you you can come into it, you can come into our regular classes. Some gyms have private. Um, personal training sessions, one-on-one -on -one sessions that go for several weeks. Um, you know, it, it oftentimes is very, is, it depends on the gym. Um, so uh, improve, you know, the future direction also, it, it'd be important to, you know, look into or create a standard or research, you know, look into, do research on the standards of um, the, the general practice guidelines, um, progressively limiting volume uh, on a weekly basis. So you don't have, you know, one day where you're doing 200 pull-ups and maybe the next week you're only doing 20. Um, and you know it's important to have more studies on risk stat stratification. Um, you know none of these. You know a couple of the studies actually mentioned that there was no age uh, correlation to uh, to these injury risks. Um, you know definitely none of them talked about any medical diagnosis contraindications. I think that's you know an important place um, for the uh, for this research to go in the future. Um, so you know a lot of these in the international competition there's a, there's a masters division. It goes anywhere you know from 40 plus to 65 plus. Um, you know, you see Matt Santiago, I didn't realize he was that old, but apparently he's hanging out with the, with the geriatrics, you know, so these, I mean, these, these patients, I think it's important to, to research, um, this patient population, because as you can see, they, they can clearly benefit from a program like this, um, you know, keeping them involved in the community, um, you know, would obviously help pre you know, prevent dementia, um, you know, keeping them, keeping them involved, uh, also, you know, their risks uh, for morbidity and mortality, especially in America, are associated with, you know, hypertension and diabetes. Metabolic syndrome could be minimized by a program like this, but there's no research specifically saying what um, master's athletes' risk of injury is, uh, whether they're more likely or less likely to get hurt. You know, I, I would, you'd guess that, you know, if, if they have tighter Achilles tendons, they're probably more at risk to um, have an Achilles tendon rupture. Um, so maybe certain exercises they should avoid or not. Um, but it's area an area for CrossFit to improve and you know research to improve in the future. So I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Mayton for being my advisor, um, Peter for a delicious breakfast, 
um, everybody for listening to me ramble about something that I really like, and I hope you guys learned something about and enjoyed. Um, and good luck to all the applicants. Don't stress out. Dr. Mayton doesn't ask you hard questions. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions?